morning, everybody. Welcome to our class this morning. Worse than a bunch of kindergartners, you know? Good morning, everybody. Am I on? You can hear me? If you can't hear me in the back, raise your hand. Okay. We're all here, a couple people still signing in, that's fine, we'll let them do that. We're going to let our young people share their scripture with us right now, so uh, uh, who's first? Libby, you're first? Okay, there you go. The verse I chose is Hebrews 3, 13, verse 16. Do not forget to do good and to share what you have because God is pleased with these kind of sacrifices. I like this verse because it reminds me to always have a faithful and serving heart. I see in this verse that God gives me gifts to help others, and he gives me his commandments to follow. I should always try to be a helping hand when I can, because that's what God wants me to do. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being my helping hand and giving me gifts to share with others. You are always by my side, helping me through my ups and downs. I confess the sin of doubtfulness. I should always put my full trust in you, because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Please keep everyone safe and put your healing in your hand around everyone. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you, Lily. Tell them who you are. Um, I'm Lily Janetsky, an eighth grader here at OR. Okay, you can start with your name. Go ahead, yeah. I'm Abby Schaffler, and I am in eighth grade. First Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I like this verse because the word strengthen. I see in this verse that whenever I don't have confidence in something I am doing, this verse reminds me I can do anything because Christ is always with me and working through me. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are powerful. Thank you for helping us when we are in trouble. Please help us to remind ourselves that when we are scared or lost, you can strongly lead us through the right path. Help us to have courage in you and ourselves. Thank you for reminding us that we are worth so much. In your precious son's name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, girls. Thank you much. Have a good day. All right, we have uh, one announcement, at least one. Carla? Good morning. If I'm up here, you know I'm looking for volunteers for the bag lunches for the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. Uh, this month, it's scheduled for the 16th of January. It's a Monday. And all donations have to be in the kitchen by Sunday the 15th. Thank you for your donations and your those who volunteer to prepare them in advance thank you thank you girl you know it's a rule that nobody can make an announcement up here without a clipboard i got one <laughs> i got one there you go all right you're set thank you okay thank you welcome back everybody hope that you had a good christmas uh break uh, we did. We had uh, Christmas with all of our family, with the exception of two, our oldest grandchild and his new wife. Uh, he's low on the totem pole in his job, so he had to work. Um, but otherwise, they were all here, so it was great. We, we had a wonderful time. I pray you did, too, as well. Here's a couple of uh, leftovers from, okay, here we go. There you go. From Christmas, um, Joseph says to Mary, how many times do I have to say I'm sorry? I forgot to make reservations at the inn, okay? <laughs> the real reason it was a silent night. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? That's why. And then another um, wise man, all that left on the baby registry is myrrh? <laughs> You know, you got to have kind of a weird mind to just to do these. And then this one, uh, apropos of nothing, how many of you have watched the, the um, uh, movie The Christmas Story? Yeah. All right? You should watch it if you've never, because it's what we grew up with. It's what we, this is, and the leg lamp is the feature thing. Well, this is a senior leg lamp. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> I knew you'd appreciate it. <laughs> That's kind of weird. All right. There you go. 
Now, Christmas Story is one of my favorite movies. Uh, I try to watch it every year. Missed it this year. I gotta, I gotta watch it yet. So, it's a. My kids asked me why I like it. I said, that's what I grew up with. We went down downtown and looked at the store displays and saw Santa and all that kind of stuff. We did all of that right, in St. Louis. But St. Louis is a mirror image of, of Milwaukee. They're, they're, they're two towns that are alike. So anyhow, um, let's, uh, let me get my, re re my recorder out going so we can record this. I don't know why, but we do. <laughs> let's uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being with us over the holidays, for the opportunities we had uh, to worship in your house, to celebrate the gift of your Son. <clears throat> and now, as we as we enter into the new year, we pray that your guidance and blessing would be upon us, that you would watch out for us, that you would lead us, and that you would bless us with your love, so that we, in turn could be blessings to others. Bless our study this morning as we delve into this story of the birth of Jesus and the things that surrounded it. Uh, guide us as we uh, look at these verses. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, just to refresh your memory, we have looked already at the story of the birth of Jesus from Matthew's viewpoint where he focuses on Joseph. Luke tells us the story of Mary and what the birth was for her. Uh, Matthew tells us about Joseph, and Joseph is the uh, a, a engaged husband, engaged man to be a husband for Mary, and while they were engaged, and, and, and very strict rules, they, she would live with her parents during this year of engagement. While this is going on, uh, the angel visits her, we know this from Luke, and tells her that she's going to have a child and she's to give him the name Jesus. Uh, then she tells Joseph, and you can imagine what that conversation is like as he tries to, she tries to explain Joseph that the child is by the Holy Spirit, not by any man, and he goes, yeah, right, um, and seeks to divorce her, which is the, the least public option that he has. Uh, he could have her brought on charges and even stoned to death if he really wanted to pursue it. But he doesn't, he just seeks to divorce her quietly, and that's when the angel comes and visits him in a dream and says, take Mary as your wife, for she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and the, you shall give the child the name Jesus. And for me, that's the linking connection between the two stories of the visit of the, uh, Gabriel to Mary and the angel to Joseph. She would have said, I'm supposed to name him Jesus. He hears from the angel, name him Jesus, and he goes, aha, Mary's right. This is what happened, and he marries her, and um, then they uh, end up in Bethlehem, and that we know from Luke, and um, what, after the child is born, and Matthew tells us about the visit of the magi, the wise men, the magicians. Uh, they would have probably been from Persia. They would have been called wise men, which was a, a very complimentary title. Uh, the, they were advisors to kings, they were astro astrologers uh, watching the stars and from the stars they knew a new king had been born. How did they know it was king of the Jews? This is all repeat of what we did before. How did they know it was king of the Jews? They knew that because of, and many think, because of the influence of Daniel some 600 years before, 500 years before, who was brought to Persia by Nebuchadnezzar and became the chief wise men uh, for, the, uh, for the Babylonian court. And he would have been the teacher and instructor of future astrologers. And he would have told them not just about the stars, but would have told them about the prophecies uh, in, the, in the Torah, in the Old Testament. And so that, those stories would have been passed down over the generations among the wise men of Persia until they saw this star and everything clicked for the wise men. I'm, I'm, I can't give you book, chapter, and verse of any source that says this, but this is a, a reasonable conclusion as to how they ended up knowing that this was the king of the Jews. And so they, they know that and they send a delegation. We said last time that we don't know how many wise men there were, 
Uh, there could have been three because of the three gifts. There could have been 12. It probably was a fairly large entourage because they would have traveled a long distance. Um, I know pictures and things show them going across the desert. That's probably not the route they went. They went across what's known as the Fertile Crescent, which is to go from Persia north along the Euphrates and Tigris River and into Mesopotamia and then down into Syria and Israel. That would probably be the route uh, that they would have taken. Nonetheless, it would have taken them months to make this trip, if not a year. Um, and they would have done it without doubt with a, a fairly significant entourage. You didn't just wander around out there without escort, uh, especially carrying gold and, and frankincense and myrrh. Those are very valuable things. So again, we, have, we don't know. We simply don't know how many. Uh, it's always depicted as, as three. One of the sources I said, if you really want to want to excite people when they come into your home and see your manger scene, Put 12 wise men across the room <laughs> and then let them move up every day until they finally get there because they did not come to the stable. Matthew makes it very clear that they came to the house where they were staying uh, and presented their gifts. So, and it was within probably about a two year window. How do we know that? Because Herod asked for them what time the star appeared and then Herod, as we'll read today, killed the children in Bethlehem two years old and younger. So it was in that, probably that two year time window uh, that they um, saw the star and made the trip. Um, so, uh, and then they, then they drop off the page of history. We hear nothing more about them, nothing more said, nothing more said about the gifts. Uh, it just, that story ends and it's done. Um, as, as a number of stories in, in scripture do, that it just ends and it's done. So. We know what we're supposed to know. Matthew didn't answer all the questions. We're going to talk about that in our sermon on Sunday. He didn't answer all the questions, uh, but he gave us the right answers um, that we need to know. All right, with that kind of as a background, uh, let's pick it up at verse 13. Uh, Linda, we'll let you uh, read this again. And pick it up and read uh, just simply verse 13 through uh, 15. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Okay. Herod's plan to um, quote unquote worship the child uh, was thwarted by an angel. Another visit of an angel to Joseph um, mirrors the Old Testament Joseph. Uh, not only in angel visitations, but also now he goes to Egypt, which is what Joseph did uh, with his family. They went to Egypt. And so uh, we get a, a connection back to the Old Testament Joseph in a number of ways. Uh, they do this right away in the, in, the, in the middle of the night, it seems like, and they escape. Um, um, many uh, films of this will depict that they got out of, they were out the back door while the soldiers were coming in the front door. Um, may not have been, may have been that close, may not have been, but either way, they, they got out and they went a fairly significant journey uh, across what we know as the uh, as Gaza and the, the desert, uh, across the Nile Valley, and then to a town probably, and it doesn't tell us, but they probably ended up in Alexandria. That's a picture or a depiction of what Alexandria may have looked like in the first century. Alexandria was a major, major city in the Mediterranean world. It rivaled Rome and Ephesus uh, in terms of its importance. It was a port city. It was the really the, the uh, main city for, for Egypt at the time. Uh, it had a large group of Jews there. Two quarters of the city were exclusively Jewish, and so he would have been welcomed there and had lots of friends there. Uh, many jobs would have been available for a man who worked with his hands. 
Uh, we often depict Joseph as a carpenter, and he was. But that's kind of a, we see a carpenter with, with uh, um, a, uh, a, a table saw and, and um, hammer and nails, but it's more of a, a man who works with his hands. Probably was as much a mason as anything else. Uh, build things. Uh, and he would have found work in Alexandria. Um, it was the capital city for the what was known as the Jewish diaspora, uh, the dispersion. The, the Jews, uh, going all the way back to the Syrians in 722, when Israel was destroyed, and they were scattered, and the Babylonians did the same thing, and Jews scattered all over the Mediterranean world. Uh, by the time of Christ, there are Jews in every city uh, around the Mediterranean world. That's why Paul is able to go where he is able to go and proclaim, because he always goes first. Whatever city he goes to, he goes to a synagogue. Uh, there's only one exception to that, and that was at Philippi. Um, he goes to a synagogue, and that's where he starts, always. So there are Jews everywhere, but in Ag Alexandria was the largest contingent of Jews. Um, you may or may not be familiar, I've mentioned it a number of times, there was a, uh, the Old Testament was copied into Greek uh, in Alexandria by Old Testament scholars, and it's called the Septuagint, which is Latin for the 70. Uh, and it's often referred to in literature just simply as LXX, the, number, the Roman numbers 70, that's the Septuagint. It's an extremely important document because it gives us a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And we can see from a Hebrew word, what was the Greek word used? And then in the New Testament, we can go backwards and say, well, this is the Greek word used. If we go back to this through the Septuagint to the Hebrew, we can get an idea what the Hebrew word was behind that. Uh, so it's very helpful for translators, which I don't do much of. Um, but uh, the Septuagint was a major document. It's called the 70. Because uh, so according to the tradition, 70 scholars each took a copy of the Old Testament and translated it, and then they sat down and compared their translations, and they were the same. That's the, that's the, the, the story, the way it's told. Probably was more collaboration than that. But be that as it may, that's where it got its name, the 70, the Septuagint. But it's the Latin, English, uh, uh, the Greek translation of the... Uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, so there, there was a large synagogue there. Uh, in the synagogue, I, I learned that they, they would sit according to the trade guild, so Joseph would have sat with other p workers with their hands and would have easily found work, and they lived there for some time. Uh, how long? Don't know. A couple years, probably. Uh, they were in, in Egypt. And then it ends with... Um, uh, he remained there until the death of Herod. Herod died in 4 B.C., we know. Uh, so the birth of Jesus is probably around 6 B.C. So they were in Egypt uh, for that intervening time. And then um, it says in verse uh, 15, This is to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Um, it's a, uh, that's a, a quote from, I, from Hosea 11, verse 1. And many would accuse Matthew of taking it out of context. Out of Egypt I have called my son in the context of Hosea. The passage refers to Israel. Israel came out of Egypt. And, um, and often Israel is often referred to by God as my son. And so, yes, the, in, the, in the basic translation of Hosea 11 verse 1 it is um, it is uh, the refers to Israel but Matthew does something that most uh, Paul does it all the time too in interpreting a passage you fulfill it you give it a you fill it up you give it a fuller meaning so yes it means Israel was called out of Egypt but now Matthew takes that and applies it to Jesus and says yes that's what we're talking about. Because he makes the connection that Israel and Jesus are both the Son of God. Wherever you see Israel, you see Jesus for Matthew. And so he's doing what every good preacher does. You take a passage and then you elaborate on it. And you pull stuff out of it that maybe the original writer didn't intend, but it's there. 
And so Matthew pulls out of this passage what Hosea didn't first intend, but it, it fits. Out of Egypt, Jesus mirrors Israel. Jesus is Israel. Where does Jesus go? And the first thing of his where I'm going to read this in a, in a week or two. He goes where? To the wilderness. Where did Egypt go when they came out of Egypt? To the wilderness. That's why they had to do that. That's just so Jesus' life mirrors Israel. He is the new Israel. And so that's what that's the whole point that Matthew's making. This is not just coincidence. Just as Israel came out of Egypt, so Jesus now comes out of Egypt. He is the new Israel. He is the Son of God. He is the one who has God's blessing. So where Israel is God's son, Jesus is God's son. And so this, um, this is a significant passage that Matthew and as we said, to fulfill a prophecy doesn't mean to replace it. It means to take the words that were written in the context of they were given and then make it filled with a new, with a bigger meaning, a fuller meaning. And that's what Matthew does. And he'll do that a couple more times in a couple more passages. Actually, he does it throughout his gospel. But uh, we'll see that again a couple of times here. <coughs> and so out of Egypt... They come. So they were in Alexandria for, for a couple of years, and then they finally came back to, um, to uh, Israel. Let's read verses 16 through 18, please. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, reading, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Okay. Matthew does the same thing again. We'll talk about that, uh, that verse. It's an it's a interesting verse. Joseph travels to safety. Um, and as he is in Israel, uh, in Egypt, then Herod uh, realizes that the wise men uh, are not coming back as he had asked them to. And so he's left. What, what does Herod know with the wise men not coming back? He knows that it was in Bethlehem. And he knows that the child was two years old or younger. That's all he knows. He knows that in Bethlehem are the descendants of David. Herod has been looking for an excuse to get rid of any possible descendants of David because they would be the only ones who could have a claim on the title king of the Jews. And so he sees this as his opportunity, if you will. And it's not anywhere near above Herod to do this. Um, he is, um, he goes to the town of Bethlehem or he sends his soldiers and um, eliminates all the baby boys um, two years old or younger. What? Egypt. Killing of, killing of babies. Does that ring a ring a bell? Yeah, it's Moses. So Moses again is like Jesus. There's a definite connection here. Just as Moses escaped the slaughter of babies in Egypt, so Jesus escapes the slaughter of babies in Bethlehem. Uh, very definite connections. Those are not accidental, by the way. This is all part of God's full plan. So, um, lest you think this was a, a horrible slaughter, and it was a horrible slaughter, but Bethlehem in the first century was a very, very small town. If you see a movie that depicts the birth of Jesus and you see it in a very, very small hovel-like town, that's pretty much what it was. It was not a big city. It was very small. Um, estimates are the number of children would have been less than 20, which is still tragic for every family that lost a child, how tragic that would be. Um, and so, uh, but it was not a huge number. Uh, it was a, a small, smaller group, but it's still a very, very big deal. And that's why um, Matthew quotes this passage in verse 18 from Jeremiah, a voice heard in Ramah, 
weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Um, it, it is a, 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 and many years ago, there was a, a, a six part series done on Jesus of Nazareth. It was on TV. It was very, very well done. Um, and in the part about this incident, the movie depicts uh, Simeon sitting on the steps of, of the temple, having heard this story and weeping and reciting these verses. It's a very powerful moment in the movie. Uh, and now, again, people will excuse Matthew um, to uh, uh, of, of misusing this passage, but um, we need to understand how Hebrew, Matthew was through and through Hebrew, how he interprets the Bible. There are three different levels <coughs> of interpretation, and any good preacher uses these levels, although we may not have a name for it. The, the Peshat level, which is the Hebrew term, is the basic historical meaning. What's the story? And Mark does that. He just simply tells us the story. He lets you figure it out. It's just the basic historical context. That's the Peshat level. There is a uh, Remez level, which word means to hint, which means that the, the basic story hints at a deeper story. There's more to this than what you see. Luke writes pretty much at this level. He's continually hinting. In fact, Luke goes so far as to interpret things for his Gentile readers. That's what this means. Uh, and so you have that level. And then the, um, the uh, Midrash level uh, is the homiletical level. That's where it's interpreted. That's where it's given a fuller meaning. Matthew often writes at this level, uh, where you take something from Scripture and you give it another explanation. And every preacher does this. Right, Roger? Where are you? <laughs> every preacher does this. We take something from that level, and we, we, we in the seminary, they were taught, they, we were taught gospel handles. You know, you look for the gospel in a story, and you, you expound off of that to share the story of Jesus. And that's what Matthew does in this. So what's the, what's the basic uh, root meaning of this story? The basic root meaning of this story is about Rachel, who was buried near Bethlehem. Um, and it fulfills this passage. Um, Rachel uh, was near Bethlehem. She was from that area, but near Bethlehem when she died. Uh, she gave birth to her, to her son, her second son, the twelfth son of Jacob, and, uh, and died in childbirth. Before she died, she named the child <clears throat> Ben-Oni, which means son of my trouble. And Jacob, after she died, said, no, it's not going to be son of my trouble, it's going to be Ben-Yamin, uh, which means son of my right hand. Benjamin um, is how we know it. And so that's after, uh, and so then he, he didn't bring her back into the town. He buried her along the road near Bethlehem. And this picture is, uh, is the tomb of Rachel uh, along the road to Bethlehem. Now the basic context of the passage from Jeremiah is that when Nebuchadnezzar took the exiles to Babylon, they would have traveled on this road from Jerusalem going west, going east, and they would have been weeping. And so it's, you have to see uh, refugees being taken from their homes, going past this site where Jeremiah writes, a voice was heard in Ramah, and that's where the burial is. Ramah is the area where she's buried. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in loud lamentation. What were the refugees doing? They were crying as they were being taken into exile. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. The refugees were gone. So Matthew takes that story and he fulfills it, gives it a fuller meaning and applies it now to the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. Um, and makes that connection back to the oppression of a, of a foreign despot who uh, kills people 
uh, simply because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, it's a tragic story. It's another one of those stories that ends there. We don't hear any more about this. There's no more rep repercussions to this uh, that we know about. I'm sure there were repercussions to this. But it gives you a glimpse into the first century of what living around Herod was like. It's why we go back to when the wise men came to Herod and said, whereas he was born king of the Jews, we are told that Herod and all Jerusalem with him was troubled. You see why? That's what Herod does when he, when he interprets a threat to the throne. That's what he does. Um, he is um, not a nice guy. Okay, comments, questions? How are we doing? All right? Okay. Now we're going to spend uh, about 10 minutes on five words. Um, and then, um, and it's verse 19, four words. When Herod died. Uh, it just goes by that, but I want to tell you what that was a little bit like uh, in the, and give you again a, a picture of what the context of first century Israel is. Um, Herod is, uh, Rome is, um, left, Herod left a legacy of terror and death. Uh, his own death was seen as divine judgment on him. Um, Herod, um, prior, just prior to his death, the Romans demanded that the official seal of Rome would be put on the temple gates, an eagle, and so Herod, as king of the Jews, complies. He didn't really have a choice. And the response of one of huge anger by the people, uh, an eagle was over the temple. Hosea actually um, prophesied this. And the people, and people threw down the golden eagle. Remember, you cannot have any graven image. And they were serious about that. They threw down the golden eagle. They cut it into pieces. Um, and Herod's response was mass arrests executions, burning some people alive, some he uh, skinned alive, um, at least 10 of them. Uh, he, the night he does this, there's an eclipse of the moon, which is seen to bide Herod's end. God was bringing judgment. Now I'm going to read to you, I don't think, uh, maybe I brought the book down. Yeah, I did. Uh, the fascinating, those of you who suffer from insomnia, here's a great cure for it. <laughs> it's the book of Josephus. It's, uh, it's only a couple pages long. Um, this is written by uh, really the first modern historian, if you will. And it's written somewhat a few years after the life of Christ, but it covers the whole New Te Old Testament, New Testament history. Josephus was originally kind of written off as being, well, he didn't know what he was talking about, but the more and more we have learned about that period, the more and more Josephus is correct. And so he's really read in very high regard these days, uh, that he has a pretty good handle on what was going on and what happened. It's basically straight history. Um, again, it's, it's hard to read. Uh, it's small print and it comes. <laughs> so uh, you got to really want to read it. Uh, I didn't read all of it, but I've read portions of it. I'm going to read to you. A, this is about the page where it says when Herod died, okay? Um, Herod's distemper greatly increased upon him after a severe manner, and this by God's judgment upon him for his sins. For a fire glowed in him slowly, which did not so much appear to the touch outwardly, as it augmented his pains inwardly, fire in his belly. Uh, it brought upon him a vehement appetite to eating, which he simply could not avoid to supply with one sort of food or the other. His entrails were also ulcerated, and the chief violence of his pain lay in his colon. Um, a, um, affected the, the bottom of his belly. I'm not reading all of it because it's too gross. Um, uh, it is, he produced worms from inside his belly. Uh, he had difficult breathing, which was very loathsome because his breath had a horrible stench to it. Uh, he had convulsions in all parts of his body. Um, it was said by those who pretended to divine and all who were endured with wisdom 
to foresell to foretell such things that God inflicted this punishment on the king on account of his great impiety uh, that's how Herod died a very hideous difficult difficult death but now here's an interesting side note note into history uh, with Herod when Herod knew that his end was coming he told his sister what troubles me most is that I will die without being mourned people will actually celebrate when I die and he didn't want that to happen so what he did was he invited all the Jewish leaders to come to his palace which they did because under pain of death if they didn't show up he incarcerated all of them took them to the Hippodrome and gave command uh, to his sister that um, the doors were all locked and he gave a command that when I die kill them all that way the people of Jerusalem will mourn didn't bother him who they were mourning for just that he wanted them all mourning Josephus puts it this way he commanded that all the principal men of the entire Jewish nation wheresoever they should live should be called to him accordingly they were a great number that came because the whole nation was called and all the men heard this call and death was the penalty of such that should despise the call and now the king was in a wild rage against them the innocent as well as those that had afforded ground for accusations and when they came he ordered them to be shut up in the hippodrome sent for his sister Salome uh, and her husband Alexis and not the Alexis that you have on your table uh -huh. but <laughs> and spoke to them I shall die in, in a little time so great are my pains which death ought to be cheerfully borne and to be welcomed by all but what principality tri what principally troubles me is that when I die without being lamented and without such mourning as men usually ex expect at a king's death for that he was not unacquainted with the temper of the Jews that his death would be a thing very desirable and acceptable to them because during his lifetime they were ready to revolt from him and to abuse the donations he was he had dedicated to God and therefore he was their business to resolve and afford him some alleviation of his great sorrows in this occasion for that if they do not refuse him their consent in what he desires they shall have great mourning at his funeral um, such as never had any king before so he desired therefore as soon as he could he had given up the ghost that's the way Josephus puts it as soon as he'd given up the ghost, they shall place soldiers around the Hippodome while they don't know that he is dead and that they should not declare his death to the multitude till this is done, but they shall give orders to have those in custody shot with their darts and this slaughter of them all will cause that, that he shall not miss to rejoice on a double account that as he is dying, they will make him secure that his will shall be executed what he charges them to do and that he shall have the honor of a memorable mourning at his funeral. If you aren't going to cry for me, I'll make sure you do. Um, however, when word of his death came, his sister Salome went to the Hippodrome and set them all free. <laughs> so they didn't die. She thwarted his plan, and everybody was pretty happy that Herod finally was gone. What Israel looked like after Herod was gone, we'll deal with probably next week. Um, but uh, let's go back to the text. Uh, now, uh, Linda, would you read uh, 19 down through 23? After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the distri district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Okay. Um, he went and uh, we are told that he went to live in the city of Nazareth. Uh, he was afraid to go back to Judea. Herod had died, now he could go back. Uh, but he didn't want to go back to Judea because that was where, when Herod died, and we'll talk about this next week, the, the land was divided up by Rome into sections. Herod had three sons principally that, that survived. Uh, I didn't tell you about the one son 
who five days before Herod died thought that his father had died, declared himself king. Herod wasn't dead. He had him killed. <laughs> you cannot take the throne from him. So that's, that was Herod. Um, we're going to leave him alone now. Um, but they couldn't go back there because of Archelaus. And uh, so they uh, go to uh, Galilee instead. Uh, to give you a flavor of Archelaus, um, he was pretty much like his father. The very first Passover, Archelaus, the people appealed to him to release the captives. Um, some still held from the eagle incident. Remember the, at, at Pontius Pilate when they said during Passover he would release one prisoner? Well, they appealed to that already under Archelaus. And, and so Archelaus invites them uh, to uh, come and show Passover, and he sent troops among the worshipers and killed them all. 3,000 were killed. Um, Passover was canceled. The people ordered to go home. Um, Joseph would have probably heard of this. That's why he didn't go there. He didn't go to, Ju do, to Judea. That wasn't a very safe place. And so he went to Galilee, which was ruled by Herod Antipas, which was Ar Archelaus' brother. And we'll tell you more about that next week. So he went to live in a city called Nazareth, uh, so that he would be called a Nazarene. Interesting. You can search the Old Testament from front to back if you want to be that diligent in your search, and you will not find any prophet anywhere that says that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. It's not there. So what does Matthew do? Does he just sort of invent this out of whole cloth? Not quite. It, it is not there word for word, but it is throughout uh, the, the prophets that um, Nazareth uh, is referred to. But you've got to understand the name Nazareth. Nazareth in Hebrew um, means literally branch town. Um, it's it, uh, from the passage where out of the root of Jesse a branch will grow, Isaiah. And Nazareth was populated by the Davidic, the, the uh, Davidic Jews who lived in Bethlehem and moved to Galilee for their own safety sometime before. And that's who populated Nazareth. You won't find Nazareth in the Old Testament. It's there now. And they called it Nazareth, Nazareth uh, from the Hebrew, which means branch town. And so what Matthew is doing is he's sort of taking reference from Isaiah 11, the branch town, and he says the prophets, and he puts it in plural, not singular. He doesn't say the prophet says. He said prophets, uh, and they allude to him being the branch of Jesse. And so Matthew was basically saying he will be called a branch. That's what the word Nazarene means. He will be called a branch or the branch. So he's the branch. Matthew identifies him. He's the branch that comes out of Isaiah, out of the root of Jesse, the stump. And you will see that uh, in um, various symbols that we use around Advent and so forth. You'll see the stump with a branch coming out. Uh, that's what's referred to. And that's why he's given the name the branch, the Nazarene. Um, and so Joseph and Mary go to Nazareth. They're related to the people there. They're all from his family, his tribe. Uh, Mary by, is also a, uh, also a uh, descendant of David. She's Davidic as well. She's also got Levite and Judean Davidic blood in her. So she's Davidic as well. So they're welcome there. They're, they know there. Now Nazareth, again, is a small town. And any of you who've ever lived in a small town know what that's like. It didn't take them long to know that Joseph and Mary were back home. This is where they had lived. This is where they, were, they had grown up. Uh, this is where Joseph intended to build a house for Mary and move in anyhow, so he probably had the house yet still. And so they had a place to live. He had an occupation. He was recognized. And so they settled in to the town of Nazareth. Um, this was a, uh, uh, a, a significant thing. And, now, uh, and then, the, um, then the narrative stops at this point. We know that they're settled in Nazareth, and it stops 
And now you have to, if you have your own Bible, between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of the chapter 3, add, put in add 30 years. Because that's what goes on between those two chapters. 30 years happens. Now what happens to Jesus during those 30 years? That's a big question, uh, which none of the gospel writers answer. Mark, when he starts his gospel, starts it at where, verse, at where chapter 3 picks up. The story of John the Baptist. That's where he starts. He doesn't even talk about the birth of Jesus at all in the first 30 years. Luke is the one who gives us a hint of what was happening when he talks about Jesus going to the temple at age 12. Uh, and he is sitting down with the scholars of the temple, the rabbis, and bouncing questions after them. This is what Jewish scholars love to do is do questions back and forth and they're not just routine questions like you know how many days of creation I mean they're they're deep questions of why did why did God refer to an almond tree when he talked about building the temple instead of a pear tree for example and they would debate that odd infinitum well that's the kind of thing he would have gotten involved in when he was 12 and they marveled at his ability to discuss this well, the reality of his parents finally find him, and you can imagine that little discussion they had. You know, when you, you've had that discussion, and maybe you've ever, have any of you ever been lost as a kid? And when your parents find you, you have this huge double message. Wow, I'm so glad to find you. What in the Sam Hill were you doing right away? <laughs> so you don't know whether you're welcomed or whether you're in trouble. And the answer is yes. <laughs> well, that would have been the discussion they had with Jesus. And anyhow, he goes back to Nazareth with them, and he has no, there's no rabbinic school in Nazareth. There's no one to teach him other than picking up uh, what he would have uh, gotten from the local rabbi or from passing rabbis who would come through. Uh, the school of Gamaliel was in the north, the Gamalian school of, uh, of Jewish theology, if you will, and so he may have had contact with that. Um, but he was pretty much on his own, and he probably ended up um, being a builder. His father, somewhere in that 30-year span, passed away because he's never mentioned again. Joseph falls off uh, the map as well. You don't hear his name anywhere, and the only assumption is that he would have died. Uh, Joseph would have been in his early 30s, at least, when he got married to Mary. Uh, Mary would have been 14. Um, give or take. And so for married out, live Joseph would have been normal. Uh, Joseph would have gotten to maybe 50. You know, uh, life span was not long then. And, but anyhow, Joseph's gone. So Jesus is the oldest brother. He has six brothers, um, six siblings for sure. Uh, and, and so he has to take care of the family. And he does this by being a carpenter, or being a, a bricklayer, a mason, a man who works with his hands. Uh, that would have been his job. And nothing is said of him until we get to the next chapter. 30 years later, all of a sudden he appears on the scene with John the Baptist. But we got to talk about, we're not going to, and I want to get in John the Baptist, but I'm not going to do it today because there's not enough time. And there's a lot that I want to give you. Again, with just um, in the first sentence, when John the Baptist came preaching in the region of Judea, we're going to talk. We're going to tell you what that was like for him. What was going on? What's the backdrop? What's the background? Uh, what does Matthew not tell you? What does Matthew assume that you know? We're going to try and fill that in uh, next time. Let me give you a hint as to next time. Some of you will treat this with good news. Some of you will not. I don't know. Um, my wife and I um, have this habit of wanting to go see our uh, grandkids play sports, but only one family of our grandkids play sports here. The others are in Kentucky. And so we are going to go to Kentucky next week, and in order to get to one of our grandson's games on Thursday night, we have to leave early Thursday morning, which means I won't be here. However, I have talked with Jamie, and we are going to record the next two, and this is true for the next two weeks. We're going to record the lessons. You'll be able to watch me right there. And Jamie will make sure I don't look real good. Um, won't you, Jamie? 
as much as I can. Fix what you can, okay. And so you'll be able to watch there, hear it all right through the loudspeaker. Everything will be right here. The donuts will be here, I trust. Uh, whoever bringing donuts, you have donuts here. Coffee will be here. Uh, everything will be the same. Gather here, and you get to watch me for a couple of weeks. Um, and then I'll be back uh, in, uh, in three weeks for uh, continuing the discussion. What I look to do next week, uh, subject-wise, is to go into the story of John the Baptist. We're going to blow a couple of myths with that story and tell you what's going on in Israel uh, 30 years after the birth of Jesus. What does Israel look like now? What's the political scene? What's the, the religious scene? And uh, where does John the Baptist come from? Uh, why does he do what he does? And so forth. We'll get into all of that. And then, uh, then Jesus comes on the scene and is baptized. And we'll talk about all that next week. And then the following week, uh, well, the following week we may do the baptism. I, I don't, don't know how this is going to stretch out. The following week may be the baptism of Jesus and what that, all, all the implications of that. But then we'll get into chapter 4, and that's the temptation of Jesus. And so uh, my plan is to do that when I get back and get chapter 4. So we'll spend a couple of weeks on chapter 3. Uh, and that's my plan. I don't know if that's going to work out like that, but it uh, depends on how fast I talk. <laughs> so that's where we're going, okay? So show up next week. Please do. Um, it, will be, it will be live streamed as well. Right, Jamie? Yes. So if you really would rather have your coffee at home on your couch, I guess you could do that. Uh, but, um, but it will be on there. Uh, I've got a, a, a task ahead, and that is to record both of those between now and next Tuesday um, when we have guests coming to stay at our house for three days. Uh, my uh, college roommate and his wife, they have a grandson who is playing at Concordia on the same basketball team as our grandson. So they're coming up, and he wrote to me the other day, and he says, guess what? We're going to stay at your house. I said, oh, good. <laughs> We're about to leave. So that's where we'll be next week doing that, and then, then we'll head down to Kentucky on Thursday. So uh, let's close the prayer. Gracious Lord, we ask your blessing upon us as we go our separate ways. Guide us, O oh Lord, in all that we do, in all that we say, so that we may continue to reflect you to others, that we might show your love, your concern, your care for others, as you give us that same love and care and concern uh, to us. Be with us then and bless us, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are about three or four slides on that that I have not used. That's going to be, we'll open with that. You don't need to bring it back. I'll reprint it for next time. So, okay, there you go.